now. All right, so, um, oh, we have uh, Anastasios joining us as well. Um, hello, so we're just starting now uh, this uh, fifth uh, live Q&A uh, where I get uh, questions from Instagram, from patrons, and uh, answer them here live. We get to have a bit of a conversation and a follow-up on each of the questions. Um, I always get more questions than I am able to answer, so I just pick the ones that I find uh, to be more aligned with what I want to share, more inspiring, um, uh, or more engaged uh, into, into particular topics that are at heart. Um, so I'm going to start with two questions. Um, Natalie just asked uh, as well uh, through an inbox, uh, but also uh, Jorge, uh, Georgia, 2019. Um, about my upcoming trip to New Zealand. I am leaving tonight um, to uh, Wellington. Um, and so uh, uh, Georgia asked, um, on a scale from one to 10, how excited are you for New Zealand? What are you gonna do there? Uh, on, on a scale from one to 10, I'm absolutely a 10, an 11. I'm super excited to be going to a, a new, uh, part of the world. I've never been there and I've heard so much whether it is about the landscapes and um, the nature and the way it manifests uh, on on the island um, on the islands and um, and how different the, that feels. I feel that I've been to Iceland once and I feel like it's going to be that type of really wonderful mesmerizing nature that is kind of different from uh, the large continents. Um, so I'm really excited about that and in particular really excited uh, to get to know a bit more about um, the, the land and the, and the indigenous culture there. Um, I'm super humbled that um, Wellington uh, on a Plate, which is this organization, nonprofit, um, invited me to cook with, uh, with Monique. They asked Monique, who would you want to invite from the final table? Monique invited me, which is a, a, a massive honor. Uh, and I'm excited to learn more from, from Monique, from her team. We're gonna go foraging uh, on the first day of uh, arrival. I literally land and then we go foraging. So I'll make sure to have a good connection to be able to post behind the scenes um, through, uh, through my uh, Instagram for, for patrons, but also for you know, everyone to get to know a little bit of what we're gonna be up to with Monique uh, over the weekend, over the week. Um, it's a pretty packed schedule. Uh, first day we're gonna go foraging and meeting um, uh, a wisdom holder from the land. And uh, after that, we're gonna be cooking mostly um, in, with, uh, with Monique in Wellington. Uh, there's a few evenings planned to be um, uh, going to different restaurants. I hear that the culinary scene in Wellington is really is really cool and exciting. So um, after that, I'm gonna have the a free weekend uh, there. So I'm super excited to get to to know a little bit more, to travel um, and to meet more people. So um, so mostly in Wellington, uh, and only gonna be there for ten days, uh, well nine, um, and um, and yeah, it's gonna be cooking. So on Thursday, next Thursday evening, there's a workshop. Um, that have been developing over the years, the content starts evolving and becomes more engaged. Uh, it's uh, going to be, it's called What is Flavor? Uh, kind of a simple title, but what we're going to be talking about there is really fundamental um, about why, how I think flavor and food education um, and uh, the evolution of diets is a fundamental aspect of human evolution. And if we want the, in this century to become better with each other and with the environment, with uh, living more ethically with other animals on this planet, we need to, uh, to learn more. We need to have uh, more access to knowledge. We need to, and that is the only way to really shift the market because that's what's really driving uh, unhealthy behaviors for us and unethical behavior towards animals or, or forests or the planet. Um, so um, I'm gonna be talking about that on Thursday. Um, it's sold out uh, already, um, so we're gonna have a, a, a little theater to talk about all this and a workshop where we're gonna be tasting things. And on Friday, we're gonna be cooking for 170 people with Monique and her team. 
uh, which is going to be, I'm pretty sure, quite a, a spectacle, a performance. Um, right, so that's the first questions, uh, two questions in one that I wanted to uh, answer from Natalie and Georgia, um, 2019. Um, I have a couple of questions here that, um, that relate to, and I've gotten this question uh, a few times. Um, I've been posting about my time in France. Um, my father lives in Bordeaux with my sister near Bordeaux in the woods. Um, and uh, he has an organic um, uh, garden. And I've been posting a lot about it. It is probably one of my main sources of inspiration as a human and as a professional uh, in food because it is so simple and so immediate um, the relationship you get to have with the uh, with with the plants and understanding it and understanding how to better work with them um, how to extract better flavors from foods that you harvest and grow um, so the question is if um, if i'm um, it's actually a question that was asked in, in spanish um, if i do uh, organic um, cultivation so I don't do it personally, but um, my father does it. And uh, I know by seeing my father, uh, how he is 50% of his time in the garden, pretty sure I'll end up in a few years or decades there uh, growing food. I think there is nothing more important than growing food, um, especially when we're just thinking about changing lifestyles and, and our relationship to, 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 the, to our environment and to health. Uh, there's only uh, growing food that kind of really can push us to that understanding and lifestyle. Um, next question by Schlangek. Um, what can we do to make culinary education mandatory in every school? That's a very good question. And it's a question that I haven't been able to fully grasp. Um, but I, I have been in, since I realized how important this was, I've been trying to do my part to um, to plant seeds uh, around to, to, to get there. Um, I always say this. Um, at schools, we teach everything that is fundamental in order to be a good human being. Um, you, t you learn um, as a kid how to write and read, right? Because it's one of the, only, we're, we're the only species uh, that writes uh, um, and, and that reads in such a, a way. Maybe we're the only ones in the universe, who knows, right? So it's something really special, but we as a species are the ones who do that. So we learn that, that is important. Um, we learn, uh, we're also the only animals that uh, extrude logic um, in the form of mathematics, geometry, science, um, and, and we have all these disciplines. And so we, we learn mathematics, we learn physics and chemistry, um, and all these uh, kind of more rational uh, aspects of what it means to be human. We also, the only animals that through word, through speech, are able to um, remember and create, uh, um, you know, to write history, to write philosophy, to think uh, as higher uh, uh, beings. And we're the only animals who do that, right? So um, that's why we have history classes and uh, uh, and philosophy classes amongst others. But we're the only animal as well um, on this planet that has the control over fire. We, we're, we're actually able to make fire, to control it, um, which is one of the main elements of, of life, right? Uh, and we're the only animals who cook. Uh, no other animal on this planet utilizes such complex techniques of heat, um, um, whether it is like preservation technique through fermentation, through salt, through sour uh, medium, all these you know, techniques of cooking were the only animals, maybe in the universe, right? Because we don't know if there's life out there. Um, so that means that we have this incredible body of knowledge around it, which we call gastronomy. Um, and we don't learn that at schools. What, why? Well, what happened? <laughs> what happened at some point, we just left one of the most fundamental things of what it means to be human. And we externalized 
food processes, whether it is growing it, selling it, caring for it, cooking it, and the general population is completely food illiterate. Uh, not completely, but I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it's a very important point, so that's why I get very emotional about it. So um, we have um, big problems right now in relationships to climate change, to health, uh, public health and wellness, right? It's, and, and we all know that food is the best medicine, a preventive medicine, uh, food and, and, and exercise, right? The body practice. Um, and, uh, and we don't teach at school. So this is why I'm so passionate about this. It, I think that in a few decades, we will look back in a few decades from now. Um, we will have every single human on earth knowing the basics of cooking and eating, um, respecting much better the animals because they have seen the death of one before in order to learn, um, you know, in a, in a cooking, in a cooking class to sacrifice an animal. Right. Um, and when we, when we will be there in a couple of decades or, or less, but I hope uh, we will look back and we we'll say we were so stupid not to be doing this beforehand. How could we be so, so silly not to put one of the most fundamental things of humanity um, in schools for kids at different ages? So you can teach chemistry uh, and physics um, by making a mayonnaise, right? Talking about emulsion, talking about light, um, or by, with, an, with the egg, for example, you can talk about light and how when it is not cooked, when it is raw, you can see through, the light goes through. But then as soon as you apply heat, the proteins kind of unfold and then the light doesn't go through and hence we see white and the egg um, white, which is not white, it's translucent when raw becomes white. So all these things you can teach. But you can teach about history, you can teach about geography, about uh, migrations, about uh, anything at all scales from age three to age 18 uh, and more, of course, you can, you can really do that. So um, there's a massive growing of, of higher education around food, but I think um, schools really need to get up. So to answer your question, uh, what can we do um, to make culinary education mandatory in every school? Well, to make it mandatory, it has to go through politics. <laughs> it has to go through politicians. Um, nobody is really talking about that nowadays. I see, I've seen Jamie Oliver being one of the only uh, voices out there really pushing that agenda. Um, I'm not sure what he's up to right now, but if uh, if um, if our policymakers do not realize this, maybe it's because they don't realize how powerful it can be um, that they're not doing it. So. Um, if our policymakers don't realize it, we can't really make it mandatory. Now, there are ways in which we can, as citizens, be engaged. Uh, I'm doing my part by talking about it this here with you, by doing it through Instagram, by, by talking about it every time I'm, I'm on, a, on, a, on a talk, for example, public uh, speaking. Um, but then, as citizens, we can also talk about it in our circles. We can talk about it um, with... Um, with our families, um, we can, if we have a, a little kid, um, if they don't get that at school, we can talk to their teachers, we can create community-based um, engagement where the people in the neighborhood, all the kids get together and make a cake. And maybe someone of the families knows a little bit and will share a traditional thing from Persia. And this is, a, oh, this is a beautiful dish. Or I'm Indian, L learn how to do this, this, this dish and you share that with kids. Uh, it's a great way to get kids also to eat healthily because a lot of kids are afraid of vegetables and they only eat nuggets and that's not good. Um, so, because they don't have the connection, but as soon as they get the connection, and there's research that proves this, as long as you cook, you get it different perspective on the food and on, on what you eat. So really important. There's many ways. I think the starting point is to talk about it. And that's what I would encourage if, if this resonates with any of you to talk about it. And it's like, hey, why are we not teaching food in schools? Um, there was food at schools, particularly in Japan, that I can remember it was called home economy. Um, and, but it was only for women for some reason. Um, and uh, and, and, and it is important also to think that if we understand food, we are able to better manage our resources, our economy, our money, um, waste less, uh, enjoy more, uh, spend less when we know how to cook. So this is really fundamental. 
Um, right, so I've uh, responded three questions for now um, on New Zealand, on um, the organic farm of my father, and on food education. Do you, any of you, have any clarifying questions? Uh, whether something you would like to add, any question related to what I just um, shared with you, and uh, and we we can build on on any of the three questions. If you want to share, just unmute yourself. Yeah, Parvati. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hi, Charles. How are you? Good. Very good. Uh, and hi, everyone. My name is Parvati. I didn't get a chance to introduce myself earlier, but I'm uh, calling from Minnesota uh, in the U.S. Uh, so, Charles, I have a couple of questions on what you said towards the end. Um, so you said uh, that uh, the vast majority of people in today's world are illiterate about food, which I thought was so interesting. Um, so I'm curious from your perspective, because you've traveled extensively um, all over the world. Uh, do you see that more as a feature of, you know, the more Western developed countries? Or is that the same uh, in more developing countries as well? Because I'm uh, from India, uh, although I've lived in the U.S. for many years now, um, and sometimes I think that uh, in countries like India, we do we respect our ancestral ways of cooking a little bit more. But you know, I also find that people are becoming a little bit more illiterate about food as time goes on. So I'm curious about your perspective on that. That's um, a super good question. Yes, you want to add something? Have a second question too. Maybe I can say that, and then you can answer both. Mm -hmm. Um, let me answer this one and okay. then you can answer the, you can ask a, an additional one as soon as I'm done. Uh, okay. I, I really appreciate you bringing this up um, because it is true that uh, generally speaking, we, we are fully literate. I say that because um, you don't know, I mean, right now, like most people know how to write and read, right? A hundred years ago, not so much, right? Um, so maybe it was... 5% uh, of people knew how to read and write 100 years ago. Now it's the opposite eventually. I'm not sure about the exact data and I apologize for that, but I know that we've been getting better at reading and writing. But in terms of food, we've kind of been losing it, right? Um, 100 years ago, if you wanted to, if you were living in the countryside or even 500 years ago, you had to, be, you had to know how to cook, otherwise you wouldn't be able to survive, right? And so you had to help your mother, you had to help your father hunting or, or harvesting, or you, you had to be part of it. Um, and I have definitely seen that emerging, how we call it, emerging economies, um, such uh, as during my travels in Kenya in particular, or um, in Colombia, in Ecuador. Um, I haven't been to India, unfortunately, but I would love to. Um, I've, I've always seen that rural populations, kids know much more about food. They're much more connected to their senses, to their sense of smell. They're much more aware of animals and life and death. Um, they're much more aware of uh, certain traditions. So it, it is being lost as well. Uh, I can think of in particular, I spent a lot of time in Ecuador working with Rodrigo uh, and kids there are looking at at the way people eat in cities as the model to follow. And that is dangerous because they're forgetting their mothers, their parents, these kids, know, their parents know uh, the traditions, uh, but the kids are uninterested in them. Uh, and that is why I think it should be mandatory to not lose knowledge, not lose ancient wisdom that has been passed in, from generations to generations, no books, uh, and people are protecting these traditions. So, but I definitely see that um, uh, in, in, in emerging economies and in rural populations, there is definitely much more um, consciousness about the importance of food, the sacredness of food, and, 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 uh, and much more relationship to the land because of that. So it is interesting. It's really in particular in the cities that we are food illiterate. Um, it is a manifestation, I believe, of industrialization, food, commoditization of food, um, so an economical phenomenon, um, a social phenomenon, because we've kind of forgotten about it, and we now kind of just eat out, and we have all these people that cook for us, and we don't need, we can survive without knowing anything about food apart from what we love eating. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely an important one, and I really appreciate you bringing it up as, as, as something, as a nuance um, that is really important. Um, so if you want to ask a second one. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my second question is related to that. Um, and I think you sort of started answering that in, with, your, with your answer. So as we think about uh, introducing uh, of, uh, food education at the school level, or even more informally trying to introduce that to, um, uh, to folks at a younger age, um, how do you see that playing out in terms mm -hmm. of you talked about uh, the uh, the more scientific aspect yeah. of uh, cooking like the chemical reactions and everything that takes place when you do things to food uh, ingredients and then there's also the ancestral wisdom like you said that's been passed down through generations which mm -hmm. obviously has a has a rooting in science I'm sure yeah. but you know necessarily when, when our when our grandparents and our parents are telling us how to cook something they're not talking about it in a scientific way, but they're more just passing on what they've learned from their parents and grandparents. Yeah, so how do you, how do you uh, find a, like a happy medium or a nice balance of both of those aspects? Absolutely. Um, so that's a really, another really good question. Thank you uh, Parvati for that. Um, so this is something that I've been thinking, uh, especially when I was um, at Oxford, um, we, I was studying flavor perception and I was, uh, at the experimental psychology department and we had a lot of people that were coming into the lab very interested about the work that was being done there by led by professor charles pence there were a lot of other people scientists that had I mean, not so much interest in, around it but there, the there's two things one is that the people that were working in food in different institutions around europe that i got the chance to meet all agreed on the importance of food education they like behavior change um, philosophers, um, uh, historians, um, you know, economists that knew about food and loved food, uh, architects, they're all like, this is so important. And everyone, like, there's really a big energy towards it. Um, so how do we go about it? Um, I was lucky to be part of uh, and connected with certain scientists that are some of the most prominent scientists on taste, flavor, um, neuroscience, cognitive science around, around uh, flavor and food perception. And uh, there is this kind of, um, this concept, this idea of gastrophysics that has been emerging. Gastrophysics is a multidisciplinary uh, approach to the relationship between humans and food. Um, gastrophysics is also a very fun version of astrophysics. Like the word itself is, is, is a good one in a, in a sense that it is talking about the physics or the, the, the matter of the science, let's say, the aspect, but also about gastronomy, which is a cultural phenomenon. Um, so I see this discipline, gastrophysics, as being a very good candidate to become the, the discipline that kids would study at schools. Uh, the way I would see it within the architecture of a school, because most schools don't have kitchens, apart from the kitchens where uh, kids eat at lunch, um, which that's another topic, but those kitchens could become also education and practice um, um, and also to find ways of eating better at schools. I think go, both go hand in hand. Um, but coming back to teaching about food, of course, it could happen in normal class, but it has to be embodied. It has to be felt. It has to be tasted, smelt. So I think that, you know, the, the, the chemistry labs that most uh, schools uh, have some kind of chemistry lab which has access to a, a heat, to water, um, could be an often a more kind of uh, sterilized environment with a different type of uh, approach to the design of the physical space of the learning space itself. I think that could be a good place uh, to teach not only chemistry but food um, because you would need to have certain hygiene things and machines and all that to process and to taste and to do experiments. Uh, so that, that is why, that is how I think it could show up, this idea of gastrophysics. There are a few books around it if you want to look at it. I have a dream, maybe not my first book, but the, the second one to really be around this topic um, and, and to really practice actually with my students at the Institut Paul Bocuse, uh, the ones who are on culinary leadership, we talk so much about gastrophysics. And then at the, towards the end, we actually design courses uh, where we could teach something important about anything we want, any discipline, talk, thinking about um, these gastrophysics courses. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's kind of the, the, the overall idea. Um, and then 
the second thing is um, it is a, a discipline that is multidisciplinary by nature. Any discipline, I would say, not, not every discipline because it, it would be silly to say so, but I think a, a lot of disciplines can be connected at some level with food. Uh, and we don't talk about it. That's the, that's the big thing. So, uh, for example, uh, history classes that could eventually talk about colonization by explaining how uh, it was fueled by the trade of different foods like cacao and sugar, cane sugar. Uh, and, um, you know, coffee came from uh, the African continent to the American continent uh, and started becoming big there uh, in terms of production um, and, you know, cane sugar and, um, and, uh, and all these actually uh, foods that get you high, right? Sugar, cacao, um, and, uh, and, and coffee became very famous, became very popular in Europe, uh, and then became massive in the food industry, um, corn, because they were found in one continent, traveled to another. So you can talk about this kind of exchange of uh, economical exchange about the historical by talking about with food. So, so, so it would be much more interesting if we talked uh, about it like that than if it's just facts and dates and names of people that nobody will remember anyways. Um, so I think that that's, and then every discipline could have something to say in regards to food. So that's kind of an idea, though, right? That, uh, an overall idea um, that, I, that I find very, very interesting to, to, to explore in the coming years. Um, another thing that you can do to, to help that is study food and become a teacher. You know, we're gonna need, there's no, there's food educators out there in, in cookery schools that teach mostly cooking. But if you're a sociologist or if you're an anthropologist or if you're a historian or if you're a, a, a quantum physicist and you love food, there's always a way to connect those two and eventually explain your craft and teach your craft, develop a curriculum that has food as one of the components. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a, a vision on it. Um, um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, right. Um, Santiro D21, Santiro D21 asked, um, what does, what motivates you every day? I just the joy of being alive. Um, we're so lucky when we are healthy, when we have food on our plates. Um, that it is, it is almost sad when we're not able to control our minds in order to realize how lucky we are to be alive. So with that as a baseline, then trying to find yourself, trying to figure out who you are, why you came here on this planet, what's your unique uh, gift that you want to, to put out in the world, that you want to share with other people, that you want to create, that you want to work towards. That's kind of the, the personal journey of self-discovery. Um, and then it expresses itself through your daily work. And I'm really passionate about understanding who I really am and what I can do in this world, right? And, 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 and many of us, uh, most of us have that kind of drive to, oh, well, I have this curiosity, I have this passion. Um, and you want to figure out where you're going to get with that passion. So um, that's what really motivates me is um, a gratitude of being, of, of having uh, all sorts of, uh, of abundance in terms of um, people, friends, life, air, fresh air to breathe and, and good food to eat. And, 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 and that drive towards um, doing something good and leaving a positive trace because at some point we all die. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah, it's good to, 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 to figure out a, a way of having a good life. Um, if anyone wants to, um, every, every time I'm going to finish a question, um, I'm going to leave a bit of space. So if anyone wants to jump in on mute and ask another question, uh, I see that Gabriel posted a little question here in the chat. Um, uh, Gabriel is recommending a book called La Dulzura y el Poder, uh, the author Sidney Mintz, 
um, which should be should be in power and sweetness, uh, the name of the book. Uh, Gabriel, if you want to find the link of the of the of that book, um, you can put it uh, in the comments here, and then I'll copy it. And eventually, if this call is recorded, well, it is recorded. It's gonna go on 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 YouTube. I think we could we could add the link there so people can can get there. I really thank you for for recommending it. Um, uh, so if you can find the link, it would be awesome. And then we're gonna go. Uh, I sent you on Patreon. Uh, a list of about, I don't know, 15 questions. If there's anyone in particular, go have a look that you want me to respond for sure. Uh, go there and, and, and write in the comments or, or unmute yourself and, and share. Otherwise, well, I'm, I'm going to be kind of, uh, kind of just speaking at uh, the, the ones that call more my, my attention. <coughs> so the next one, um, I have here Elizabeth joy who asked uh, which food is your guilty pleasure um, there's a few things i want to say about that um first feeling is no food should be guilty um there shouldn't be any guilty pleasure uh, there should be only pleasure only honoring only respecting only gratitude um, I think that this guilt thing comes from certain organizations of the mind and belief systems that tell you that in order to be happy, you need to suffer. Uh, I don't agree with that uh, on a very kind of uh, fundamental base level. I, I don't think that we need to, to suffer, to feel guilty in order to, to be good humans and to live a good life. Um, so that's, that's kind of the first uh, part of it. I, I don't think that there should be guilty pleasures. Now, um, there should be mindful pleasures. Um, there are some things that are not good for us in quantity. Nothing is good for us in quantities. Um, only um, actually Paracelsus, which was this 15th uh, or 16th century chemist, um, said that it's never about the poison. It's always about the dose. Water, if you consume too much water today, if you eat, drink 10 liters of water for over three days, you're going to die because you're going to deplete yourself of all uh, minerals that you need, right? Um, so water can be a poison too. Anything in large quantities can be a poison. So it's really not about what you eat, but about the quantities of it that you consume. Um, so that's one, one nuance as well. Uh, so, for example, I mean, I could ask you, right, what, what is your guilty pleasure? You will tell me, well, this very fatty cake covered in, in, uh, in Chantilly, or you're going to say, well, a very big burger, right? It's kind of guilty. I know it's fast food, it's junk food, but it's so pleasurable, right? So I, 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 that's guilty pleasure for me, or uh, chocolate, or... Um, you know, you can become really creative about it as well. But I think that none of these foods are inherently bad. There is uh, a very intelligent mechanism that we have in our bodies, in our faces, our mouth, our sense of smell. They are very intelligent mechanisms that were evolved for millions of years um, to detect and discover nutritious sources of food in our environment. This is how our senses evolve. This is the evolutionary biology uh, of, 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 of our sensory perception. Um, and that is the root of it. So if we are designed by nature to enjoy very, very much something that is high in fats, in sugars and salt, is because we need those nutrients. Fats are good, salt is good, um, Sugar is good in a, a controlled and a small and a, and, a, and a reasonable quantity. And that reasonable quantity will change depending on your, your body type, your blood type, uh, your genes, my genes. And so we're all different, right? And so there's no universal thing. And this is something that we need to shift about our understanding of diets um, because we're thinking it very simply and universally. And that's not how it works. That's not how the human body works. That's not how flavor works. So um, um, 
guilty pleasures is something that I want to avoid and I would recommend you avoiding it. If you want to indulge in something that you know is delicious, is beautiful, try to get it as ethically sourced as possible. Try to make sure that you celebrate it, that you celebrate yourself um, because you're going through a lot of things and life is not easy and then you're going to give yourself a pleasure and try to source the most ethical one, the best prepared one. Don't go eat a shitty burger if, you, if that's your guilty pleasure. Go eat the best one you can find by someone who really respects, who knows the cattle, where they come from, uh, who eventually from uh, regenerative agriculture. And that is going to be the pleasure of eating it and at the same time doing good. Uh, for you and eventually for the person selling it um, because you're giving them your money, um, right? So really think about guilty pleasures as something that shouldn't be guilty. It should be more wise, for sure. Um, and in that sense, um, I, I don't want to say that I don't have any guilty pleasures. Uh, I'm like any other human. Um, I do confess that one of the things that I love most eating and I could almost eat every day, but not good. Uh, so I try to keep it at once a, a, a week. Uh, it's something that I really love is pizza, right? That's my thing. That's uh, I, I love the bread. I love the, the, the art of bread is like one of my, one of the most complex alchemies of food. Uh, so a good bread, a good sauce, uh, eventually some cheese or some herbs. It's just such delicious right so i would say that that's some kind of guilty pleasure um but but really uh just a pleasure uh, and a celebration um so if anyone has uh wants to ask a clarifying question on this uh, idea of guilty um guilty foods or guilty pleasures please do share either through the chat or unmute yourself uh, kind of look at the next question um right here we have uh boston puppy who asks uh you think do you think we can save the world from ourselves uh that's a good that's a good question because indeed some of the greatest cultural movements uh in history have uh, and by cultural i mean uh, religious political movements have been born out of defending ourselves from the enemy, uh, right? So it's, uh, you know, last century was, oh, the West and the East, right? Communism versus liberalism um, and fascism, right? Like we had these three narratives at some point on the planet. Uh, and, uh, and that was always of trying to defend ourselves from the enemy, the evil, the bad. This, that is the evil, we've noticed who it, wh where it is, we're gonna go fight against it, right? And we're gonna create a cultural movement and everyone's gonna to come together to fight this evil. Um, and that was an old paradigm of, of, of thinking and uh, of, of, of doing kind of politics and beliefs. Um, but nowadays we're realizing that the biggest enemy is not um, someone else, it's everyone, it's us. We are around our own best enemy. We are creating through our lifestyles, delicious, luxurious, you know, life, uh, lifestyles that we all want to strive for better, for more. Uh, we are uh, consuming natural resources in unprecedented ways. We are affecting the ecosystems. We are leading species to extinction. We are uh, probably shortening the life uh, of our species uh, on a mathem purely mathematical statistical level, we are shortening how long we are going to be able to thrive because of our behavior. So we are our best enemies nowadays. And I find that scary and fascinating. Um, so we either find a way to educate ourselves because I, this is why you know, I opened Patreon thinking that I wanted to create art, so uh, objects and experiences to, to stimulate, but also food education, because I think education is the base, the baseline. And so w if, if we educate ourselves, it is very unlikely that we will um, keep on this destruction pattern. Knowledge is truth. 
um, knowledge is power and, 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 and we start with ourselves, but we, 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 we kind of also can push it um, and, and, and teach it to others. Uh, and by pushing it, I'm not, I don't mean aggressively kind of, oh, you must learn, but rather there is beauty in learning, there is pleasure in learning, uh, and you will find yourself through learning as well. So um, I feel that uh, the question is, you can, if, the question was, do you think we can save the world from ourselves? Uh, I do think we can, but I'm not sure we will. Um, and this is our responsibility, like our generation here. I'm not sure what the, the average age of uh, folks on this call, but I'm pretty sure we're somewhere around 25, 30 years old. So, uh, or maybe a bit less, maybe even more. Um, the point is that it is our responsibility. So what are we going to do with our lives? How are we going to work? Uh, how, are we, how do we speak? How do we use our speech and our voice? Uh, to go towards better. Um, it all depends on us uh, because we can get very anxious about thinking, oh, but no, but the world and the planet and, uh, you know, this culture, this other, this land, it's, we start with ourselves. And I, as, I, as I say very often, the food that we decide to eat every day is our daily political vote, is our, is our way of changing the world, the most tiny and the most fundamental one. Every day you consume food, you put food, you vote with your, with your dollars, with your money um, towards a particular organization of the world. Uh, and that is very important, really, how we consume. So um, can we change? I think we can, because I've seen people change uh, with knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm certain that we can. Uh, will we do it? It's up to us. Um, that's, uh, that's how I would answer this question. Um, if anyone wants to add uh, additional question or continue on this particular topic, I'm happy to, to respond. Um, right. Uh, next. Uh, we have some questions about art here, uh, about uh, my childhood, about, uh, about religion, um, about how much I love my followers. <laughs> Gisela asked how much I love my followers. Well, I do. It's incredible because after, so I, 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 I don't know. I had some followers uh, before Netflix show came out, or Final Table. Um, and, but then seeing the first days was like a thousand followers, new followers every day. And I was like, whoa, what is happening here? Right? Like it is, it, it has become, a life-changing um, opportunity to have this audience through Instagram, now through Patreon. I'm going to start building YouTube. Um, why? Because I want I'm passionate about what I do, but like really because people are there listening. And I am so grateful that, you know, right now uh, it's like 12 of us here uh, having this conversation. I'm so grateful that you took the time of your busy lives, of your, um, of your, of your, of your, 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 your precious time um, to come and share this space. So I want to honor that as much as I can. And um, so the question that Gisela asks is, how much do you love your followers? Well, I, I, love, uh, I love you as much as I love myself. And I love, you know, in the sense of, uh, I'm curious of what can emerge from this. Um, use of technology, the, you know, computers and, and phones and, and internet um, to, to get to exchange, to teach, to learn, to grow from this. I want to grow from this. I'm growing from you for sure. Uh, so it is uh, really, really special. Um, so much gratitude. Um, so another question um, here. I've, I have already responded this question in the past. Um, so I'm going to keep it short, but I really, uh, it's, it's, it's a good one. Uh, Melissa CGTZ is asking, how did you make it to the final table? Um, the final table worked um, in a way the casting was people from this casting agency, one of the best in the world, contacted all the best food bloggers in the world and asked them, do you know any chef, any cook that has, that is, excels and is one of the best at what they do, but they're not necessarily on the map. They're not necessarily famous. Um, who would be those best chefs in the world that 
are not necessarily famous. Um, and these food bloggers recommended people, right, um, all over the world, because of course they know, they travel, they eat in places. Uh, and through that process, they got, they reached out to about 300 people and then it started getting smaller and smaller. The casting process was really long, really tedious. Um, we had to do all kinds of things uh, in order to get there. Uh, some of us um, were able to, and this is where I don't think that the final table was a, a really perfect representation of uh, the best chefs in the world. It was just a selection of the best, but um, some people did not have a visa to go to travel to the United States, unfortunately. Uh, and even if they were incredible cooks, um, could not participate in the show because of uh, political reasons, let's say, or kind of passport reasons. Some of us have uh, better passports than others, and that is unfair um, nowadays. But anyways, um, so they did this selection uh, the best they could do. Uh, I do believe in, in the intention of, uh, of the, the production to really wanting uh, to show the diversity, the beauty, the different perspectives and different stories on food. And they did an amazing job. Um, so uh, they contacted among that, um, Rodrigo was, so they contacted a friend of Rodrigo and I in Mexico. Uh, and then every person that was contacted as a potential participant was asked who, if you had to choose one person um, that you think would be you know, the perfect pair for this, who would it be? So everyone was asked this question and everyone nominated someone. Uh, Rodrigo was nominated and then Rodrigo nominated me. <coughs> and then I nominated Rodrigo as best pair to go on this adventure. And that's how they paired uh, us up. Uh, so that's how we ended up there uh, through this kind of uh, random broad selection. And then, uh, of course, yeah, it had to be, it was really intense from the beginning, even the casting process. Um, so that's how we got there. Um, right, so next, uh, next question. Um, X generation asked, uh, what's something do you cheer up a bad day? Well, two things. One is I think bad days are necessary. They're important. They're there to tell us something. Uh, we are either not aligned with something that we're doing in our lives where we either did something that we feel ashamed of or not, not proud and we want to, uh, there's something that, like an inherent pain or there is a depression that is due to uh, maybe some, sometimes it's just lack of a healthy um, lifestyle. So a bad day always has a, a reason. And that reason is something that we should have the courage to face. It's not easy. I'm not saying this here as, uh, you know, very nice words, but it's not easy at all. Um, it happens to all of us. First thing to know, like what cheers me up in a bad day is knowing that I'm not the only one. We all, all humans go through this, right? So it's natural. Good. So that's kind of something that like, okay, uh, it's going to be fine. Um, second thing is, um, um, I think um, food and so nutrition and Embodied, embodied practice are the things that can really cheer you up uh, in a bad day. Uh, personally, meditation uh, and yoga and cooking, something delicious um, are the best things. And then, of course, friendship, love, um, whether it is from your family or your partner, that is something that can hold you, right? Community holds you, your community, your friends, your family, your love, lover or lovers. <coughs> so... What cheers you up, uh, I think, is, is love in whatever form uh, manifests. But it's okay to be in going through a bad day. I think it's, it's, it's necessary. It's a natural thing. Uh, and we should stop demonizing it and saying kind of, oh, no, that's bad. I'm, I don't want to feel bad ever. You know, I always want to be on top of my game. It's impossible. Um, you, 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 even those who pretend they can always have their dark moments, there, there is no light without shadow. And to be able to be the highest self, uh, the highest version of yourself, you need to go through the darkest self as well. And by dark, it doesn't need to be bad. It's just an internal uh, regulation system that, um, that uh, through pain, through uh, 
unpleasant sensations in the body and, and unpleasant thoughts teaches you that there's something there for you to change, something there for you to grow. <laughs> so, um, and again, if you want to access the highest joy, you need to know what the, the darkest sorrow is. Um, those things go hand in hand. You know, there's the yin and yang uh, as one of the metaphors. There's always a bit of light in the darkness and a bit of darkness in the light uh, or it's other um, 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 belief systems that uh, manifest this idea in a different way, um, which I think is, is fundamental. So, um, right, next question. Unrelated topic, we're going a bit from one to the other. Uh, Vidisha Data asks, do you think fish and poultry is a good alternative to red meats? Um, so, by red, uh, so by red meats, I guess we're, we're talking about beef mostly. Um, and if I think fish and poultry, uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, so, uh, I think some some things has, have to be nuanced. So depends on what fish, depends on what poultry. Uh, I prefer personally um, to eat a piece of beef that has come from regenerative agriculture, a piece of beef that was uh, from an animal who lived a good life, um, who lived a good life and who was sacrificed in a respectful way. I prefer that than to eat a fish a tuna fish that is on top of the food chain uh, and uh, we're disrupting, we're eating that piece of tuna, even a tiny piece, uh, is disrupting the ecosystems in a big way. Or I prefer eating that beef rather than eating a chicken that was grown in a cage that wasn't able to really walk all his life, uh, that was uh, literally born in a machine uh, where male and female were separated uh um like on a on a on a on a on a conveyor belt that's not the chicken i want to eat right so yes and no fish and poultry are better in general statistically yes they're better because uh red meat is the worst uh in terms of particularly the industrialization of beef uh, is very is probably one of the biggest ethical dilemmas of our time. Uh, and we're just kind of awakening to that. And I could speak about it for long, uh, but please do go watch documentaries. Cowspiracy is a really good one. Uh, go, go, go learn about what's actually happening with beef um, and it will definitely change your mind. Um, so we, uh, like I think that in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of water use, beef is up here then there is uh, poultry, then there is pork. Pork is actually cleaner uh, than eating uh, uh, beef, which is funny because uh, Judaism, Islam, for instance, uh, don't recommend eating pork uh, because it was dirty. <laughs> and now it's actually the opposite. It's, beef is much more polemic than, than pork. Um, but um, so let's say that the best alternative to red meat is plants, <laughs> I believe. Uh, I do think, though, that we should celebrate uh, good meat, um, good animals, happy animals, and they're part of. They're good for your nutrition. They're they can be good for the environment uh, if treated properly. You know, it's all up to us. But uh, if you can't access clean sources of uh, animal products, uh, avoid it as much as you can. Uh, if you can access, I would say have a good balance. Like I would say 70%, 80% uh, plant-based, 20% animal-based, if you have access to ethical animal-based. And then uh, I would also even tell you that a clean, um, a clean poultry that you grew yourself, giving, feeding it your, your food waste from your kitchen, your compost, uh, eating a poultry like that could be cleaner than eating rice that has been imported from the other side of the world, plant-based. So there's no easy answer in this. It's a very complex food system that we live in. There is no yes and no answer for these type of questions. There's only a nuance of things and knowledge and being as ethical as possible. Um, so um, 
yeah, as I said, uh, eating a good chicken can be better than eating a bad vegetable. And there is also bad vegetables in the sense that uh, they can be uh, non-organic, they can be polluting water, they can be they can produce tons of CO2 by traveling in boats all over the world. Um, so yeah, I hope that gives uh, food for thought. Uh, if anyone has any uh, question, anyone would like, oh, there's uh, someone else who just joined us, welcome. Um, if anyone has a clarifying, wants to ask a clarifying question about this particular topic of um, fish and poultry and, and, and red meats, what is better to eat? Do ask uh, the question uh, either on the comments here on Zoom or uh, unmute yourself uh, and, uh, and, and share. So I have a little question. Did anyone see um, a question on the post I made on Patreon um, with uh, the questions that they think they would like to get answered uh, that I haven't answered yet? If anyone has a recommendation on the next question, please feel free. If anyone, as we enter the end of the call, um, if anyone has another question that has emerged from the conversation that we've been, uh, or rather the monologue that I've been having, <laughs> uh, if you have uh, any, any other idea, please do share. Uh, I'm happy to, to respond to a new question. Have a look here. Right, if anyone wants to share, otherwise, which one should I answer? Uh, we have, well, so I'm gonna propose three topics. There's, I have a question on childhood, uh, another one on art, and another one on religion. Which one, which one would you like me to, to answer? The one who speaks first gets to or shares first what they will could be curious. Religion, Charles. <laughs> okay, religion. So um, here Mag's sweetheart asks if I professed uh, any religion. Um, so that's another tricky word. There's no easy answer to that one. Um, the word religion comes charged with uh, a complex set of historical and sociological uh, phenomena that have been happening in the last um, centuries and millennia. Religions were born uh, somewhere, you know, eventually 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years old, depending on what uh, religion uh, you're talking about. It arose with the birth of language, with the birth of scripture and art. So it's really connected with, uh, with the transmission, right? And, and, and reading and writing and singing and all this. So it is a human phenomenon. It is um, maybe, uh, we, we can't know for sure, but we are probably the only species that has and understands the concept of God and the, company, the concept of sacredness and, and, and that really practices religion. It is unclear, um, to my knowledge, where the word religion takes its root. Um, but there's one definition that I really like, which is uh, the Latin root of religion, which would be religare, a word in Latin. Religare means reuniting or uniting. Uh, and it's, I think, um, so to answer this question, I, I, I needed to, uh, to explain what I mean, what I understand rather by religion, uh, which is a word that signifies a natural phenomenon happening in humans that happens in the brain, in, in, the, in the body and in the consciousness of a human, of any human. Um, even if you're an atheist, that is your religion uh, in a way, uh, and you connect with other atheists, right? Uh, so you don't believe in God, that's your belief system. Uh, it's what in, in neuroscience is called um, like high order belief systems or belief systems. So um, what is the one I practice is a question. Um, so to give a bit of context, I was born from two families, my, both my father and my mother, were from families that were uh, Catholic uh, in France and in Colombia. Um, my, both my grandmothers were really Catholic. They would take me to church. So I was born Catholic, um, where I did like all the 
curses there where I kind of did my first communion, my all the things, all the sacraments to become a good Catholic kid. Uh, I followed that because of family. But I realized later uh, I might have been involved in, an, in a religion there, but I was absolutely not connected with the spirituality of it. I would pray um, by myself. I would talk to some kind of unknown entity uh, and, and pray, but it wasn't really connected with uh, with with this particular religion. So there was religion, but there was no religion. There was no spirituality. In it. So um, it's been a journey uh, since there. Uh, I think something that really changed my mind was actually reading, of course, things of uh, the ancient scriptures and and realizing that uh, when I visited the Vatican, I was 14, I think. Vatican is the place where, uh, in theory, the, the head command of Catholicism uh, lives, is established and operates. Uh, it is an independent city-state. And uh, when I saw the gold, all the art, all the buildings, all the abundance, all the, the extreme wealth of the Vatican, and I saw... I connected that with my grandmother and these little towns in rural Colombia where I would go and everybody would be super devoted and would go and pray to God, to Jesus, and they would get the money into the little hat and that money, part of that money goes to the Vatican. I, at age 14, I just couldn't understand this and that did not make any sense. And so I disconnected from that uh, for good. Um, I then kind of grew up to understand also that my grandfather is, was, uh, died uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, my, my grandfather was um, uh, Native American, indigenous, 100% uh, indigenous, uh, root, Chipcha uh, from Colombia. And uh, he was Catholic. He, was been, he had been converted to Catholicism. And I'm like, wow, how rich could it have been for me as a human, as a kid, to have had a non-Catholic grandfather eventually that would have had native cultures and stories. Uh, and what is my root there, right? In, in, the, in, the, in the mountains of Colombia. Um, and so I, I lost that part of my culture, my identity, right? So I, it actually brought up a lot of um, fear and discomfort um, because um, of, you know, and basically this colonization that happened in Colombia that, erased all the, the native cultures and native wisdom, which I found to be um, really sad and something that we need to fight against. So um, to go back to the question, um, today I think that um, there is an understanding that we are entering a new age in the history of humans. Um, the scientist's mind would call it the Anthropocene, uh, the age of humans. That is just, we're just entering in that. We're seeing from the, from the outside, our planet can be seen as having changed uh, because of human activity. Right? That is the definition of the Anthropocene. We're entering that age. And by definition, if we're entering a new age and we have an understanding of the universe, like we have the Hubble telescope that allows us to see the confines of the universe. We can see, you can understand knowledge that a hundred years ago, not to mention, of course, 2000 years ago was completely inaccessible to the eye um, and to the mind of humans. We could feel some truth about what was out there, in the sky and the, our place in the universe, but we couldn't really understand it with the knowledge and the facts that we have nowadays. So I think that is uh, a definite uh, game changer in what it means to be a human and if we change if we had an ontological awakening ontological meaning yeah like uh, uh, if we are redefining what it means to be human we need to redefine what religion is to humans because if religion is this um, act of uniting and relegate there I feel that there's something emerging something new something that hasn't been around that could eventually integrate all the wisdom from all the great uh, stories, the great religions, because uh, they all want the same. They all profess one simple thing, which is to live in harmony, to, um, to, to, to surround yourself with love, to love others, to be compassionate, to be kind, to be wise, to be respectful, to live in reverence, uh, and all these values that we, we need, definitely need as a species. Uh, but I think that by being competitive, 
religions, especially the three major monotheistic religions, by being competing, competing in a way, are not really fulfilling the promise of what you know religion could be for humans. Um, so, what is the one that I practice? Is uh, what I'm sharing here is I think uh, an exploration of our new understanding uh, of. Uh, uh, of community, of uh, our relationship to the land, our relationship to each other, um, and uh, and also the the quality of the stories that we tell uh, in art and uh, in particular uh, whatever form of art, right? Even if it's cooking. So, um, bottom line, and this is something that my father says. Uh, he didn't used to say it years ago, but now he's saying it. It's, I find it so cute and, and, and true. Uh, he says that uh, his religion is nature. His religion is uh, the planet. It's us. It's everything, right? It's our place in the universe. The fact that we're alive under this little thin layer of atmosphere rotating around the sun in this universe, right? So, um, and uh, and I, do, I do resonate with that very much. Uh, and so, it is not an organized religion. It is one that is, well, it's very organized from a natural perspective, but there are no humans have control uh, over it uh, fully. So uh, I guess that uh, that's the bottom line. I hope that the answer is satisfying uh, or kind of stimulating in a way. Um, all right, so we've been on for a bit more than an hour. Uh, I would like to keep it there. So. If anyone else um, wants to add a question, a clarifying question on the last one or on any of the questions that we went through, or if you have uh, an additional question, uh, there's a few, let's, let's give a few more minutes to, to close the call. Um, so if anyone wants to share either on, uh, by text or on muting your Charles. Yes, Gabriel, yes. Te voy a hablar en español porque Por es fa. un poquito difícil en, en inglés esta I'll, pregunta. Okay, bueno, la I'll pregunta translate. es fácil. ¿Cuál, para ti, ¿cuál es la diferencia entre gastronomía y cocina? ¿Sí? Y el por qué te hago la pregunta es porque académicamente acá en Colombia últimamente ha habido como una disputa entre estos dos conceptos. Uh -huh. eh, más o menos de qué se puede lograr desde cada uno. Claro, digamos... Eh, para la gastronomía se dice que se puede impulsar el desarrollo de las comunidades, pero hay otros académicos que dicen, ok, desde la gastronomía no tanto, nosotros consideramos que la gastronomía es un asunto, digámoslo así, que no puede llegar tan directo a las comunidades, entonces hablemos de cocina y de las cocinas tradicionales. Entonces, ha habido una pequeña disputa y desde el, ambos lados de la disputa no se ha clarificado ¿Por qué existe esa, esa disputa? Entonces te pregunto, ¿para ti cuál es la diferencia entre estos dos conceptos? Porque en lo personal consigo que no debe haber una disputa entre ambos, sino que debe haber un diálogo. ¿sí? Y a partir de ello, pues buscar mejores soluciones, pues no solo para la, las pequeñas o grandes comunidades, desde lo rural o de lo urbano, sino in, indudablemente para impulsar la alimentación, la cocina, la gastronomía y demás como una forma de entendimiento del mundo de manera diferente. Wow, muchas gracias por esa, por esa pregunta, Gabriel. De hecho, me encantaría llevar esa pregunta después. Eh, ¿Te molesta si te contesto en inglés? No, no, no. Ya, después podemos hablar nomás, pero... So, the question that Gabriel asked um, is what is the difference between gastronomy and cooking or cuisine? Um, because uh, he's doing some, some research work. Um, and right now in Colombia, there is dispute between those who think that eventually to solve problems in rural areas, um, there should be, uh, it should be, it could be done with gastronomy, but some people say, no, gastronomy is not that, um, that, that, that can shape, that can help uh, bringing education or progress to these rural areas. Maybe it is cooking cuisine, um, so it, it, there's a dispute and Gabriel thinks that it should be a rather a dialogue on these concepts, but he wants to have my opinion on it. Um, so, um, so really good one, I think. So this is, this is where I actually start my, my course. Uh, the one that I'm doing in the, in the Paul Bocuse is by defining what gastronomy is. 
Um, so sometimes we forget how powerful words are and how confusing they are when we don't define what it actually is and if we don't have agreements on what it actually is. So um, when you say cocina, cuisine, uh, we're talking about a physical space in a house. We're talking about uh, architecture, right? We're talking about a space, a physical space that has heat, water, tables, refrigeration in the best of cases, and that is a kitchen, right? At the, at the very simplest, a kitchen is a hearth. It's a fire and stones where you put things there and you cook, right? That's, that's the basic definition of a kitchen from millions of years ago. So when we talk about kitchen, we're talking about a place. When we talk about gastronomy, um, gastronomy, um, so the, the etymology of gastronomy, uh, so uh, the, the prefix gastro is related to the gut, it's related to uh, the digestive tract, to digestion, to absorption of nutrients, right? To nutrition. Uh, and the, 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 the suffix nomi, gastro nomi, nomi is the science of. So the science of eating, the science of gut. Um, but I would even take it further to say that gastronomy is really a social um, manifestation that uh, cultural manifestation that defines or with, through which would define the relationship between humans and nature and also humans and humans, but particular humans and their environment, humans and their natural resources. Um, I think that's, that's, a, that's an opinion, of course. Um, it is based on lots of facts, but it is an opinion, a personal opinion. There are writings um, in particular in, in uh, food and anthropology and food and history that would be super interesting and I'm happy to uh, maybe on Slack remind me on Slack uh, Gabriel to uh, ask the question and I will send you some links and PDFs that I think could be very helpful for you to, to support an argument on how ridiculous it is to be having uh, a, a discussion a dispute around whether it is gastronomy or cooking or if it is um, uh, rather a dialogue on how we can use food and food education or knowledge or culture in order to bring progress to a rural area in Colombia. Um, so let's definitely um, talk more about it because um, it's just aware of time now. But uh, as a bottom line, um, I'm super happy that you're working on what you're working and, and I am really grateful that you reached out through uh, and, and, and now join the patrons so we can have a constructive conversation around it because I do think that, especially now that you mentioned Colombia, there, there is so much way, so many ways of uh, bringing social innovation, social progress uh, through food education. Uh, I'm really excited to see it emerging and, uh, uh, and I'm happy to support you in your process. Um, so let's talk, let's talk about it. Um, I think... Um, uh, there's, uh, it's unequivocal that we need to talk about it because food is such an important component of local economies, uh, uh, whether it is in cities or in rural areas, and, 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 and just and, and global economies also. Like, who knows if one of these towns in rural Colombia doesn't have a little plant grown there that it has the cure for cancer, right? And they use it as tea. And maybe if we extracted that compound, it could be uh, the medicine of the future. Who knows? And that goes through food because now that's considered food. Ancient wisdom says you boil that tea and then you'll be fine and it tastes good, right? But then if you study that, you can actually find incredible compounds. Who knows? So I'm just saying that through this study, uh, lots of uh, evolution uh, has come uh, in history, right? We've grown to travel the world as a species and we kind of discovered foods from all over the world. So without corn, for instance, that was found in Mesoamerica, in South America, brought to Europe, without corn, lots more people would have died during the Second World War. Um, so corn saved lives, right? Because we were able to transport it from South America to Europe. And in the same way, I think we're just kind of starting to understand how uh, globalizing the power of food uh, without using it as a commodity can actually bring lots of evolution for humans. Um, so uh, 
so yeah, it's uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating conversation. I hope I gave a little bit of context on, on kind of the definition of cooking versus um, cooking as a or cuisine as a place as a space where a craft is performed and gastronomy being the kind of more global science study the study of uh, eating uh, which is of course very complex and multidisciplinary in nature. Um, sí, claro. Right. Digamos que digamos que aquí pues la confusión ha sido más que todo y entendiendo tu respuesta. La cocina acá se ha distanciado un poco de ese entendimiento y lo hablo porque incluso en, el, en la investigación que yo he realizado eh, también se ve eso, la distancia en el entender la cocina desde un espacio y más entenderlo como un fenómeno, ¿sí? Uh -huh. Entonces, ese entendimiento de la cocina como un fenómeno social, como una práctica social, eh, ha llevado a esa disputa desde lo que es la gastronomía y de, desde lo que es la cocina. Entonces... Entiendo un poco lo que tú dices y, y claro, totalmente de acuerdo en que hay una distinción así y de pronto lo que ha llevado a esa disputa es el pensar que desde la cocina, entendiéndolo como fenómeno social, se puede trabajar, más no se trabaja la, desde la gastronomía porque hay en algunos sectores que han mal entendido la gastronomía y viéndolo desde tu concepto, que lo han visto más como un asunto es no visto, un asunto como exactly. de fan. Exactly. Yeah. So, Gabriel uh, adds um, uh, that basically this dispute is because we've misunderstood what gastronomy is, um, not as a social phenomenon, but as something that is more kind of a, a cultural snob phenomenon of eating well and expensive restaurants. That is a mistake. I don't, gastronomy is not fine dining. Gastronomy is not chefs, uh, ego chefs, you know, showing up what they can do and creating new things. Um, so in that sense, um, I think they're, they're, they have a very important play, role to play. Culinary arts, um, high-end dining, fine dining is kind of the formula one of, uh, of food. So just like formula one is um, the top uh, of the te technology, of the engineering and the technique and the craft of cars, of the car industry, um, culinary arts, uh, Michelin star restaurants, fine dining chefs are like the same equivalent, but for the food industry. So in Formula One, you have an innovation uh, one day that um, this car company comes up with where when you break, you absorb energy and then that energy, you use it to accelerate when you are off the curve. Um, and that technology, of course, is amazing. It's about energy efficiency. That technology 10 years ago or 15 years ago was discovered and now it is in every hybrid car. And probably most of cars in the coming years will have technology that is similar. When you stop your car, you're actually absorbing energy and then redistributing it uh, to accelerate. So the same things happen in, in fine dining. And gastronomy, high-end gastronomy, fine dining, play that role of discovering new things, of being the art of it, and then that trickles down into finding things in the supermarket that are innovations, either flavor innovation or food technology innovation. It happens there. So um, I think that is very important to separate what we understand by astronomy and uh, uh, as, as a more global phenomenon and not think that gastronomy or is what we consider kind of gourmet or, you know, um, uh, high-end gastronomy. There's different things and uh, it's very important to clarify all this. So thank you, Gabriel, for that question. Um, I hope that everyone had, a, had an interesting, um, stimulating time um, with, through these questions. I'm looking forward to... Um, uh, share this this video on youtube or uh, we'll see first of all I'll, I'll share the recording with you all on patreon see uh, so other patrons that haven't been able to watch it can, can can see it and eventually participate next time and uh if you have any feedback if you have any comments any topics or any questions that you would like to have for next time uh post them um uh, on patreon or or on this uh, video later um, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, 
and um, and for your questions and uh, i hope to 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 see you around soon either on patreon on, yeah on patreon page or on slack or on instagram so uh, thank you all so much for for being here and i uh, wish you all a good day bye bye <laughs>